this is Darren Peters, and welcome to the Power Play Discussion Series. I'm joined here by my co-host, Sericia Nelson, and we have a great episode in store for you today. We're talking to Spencer Overton, the president of the Joint Center for Political and Economic Studies. So, Sericia, why don't you take it away? Thanks, Darren. And I'm Sericia Nelson. Um, I'm a senior advisor for communications at the Peter Damon Group. And today we're joined by Mr. Spencer Overton, as Darren has mentioned, of the Joint Center for Political and Economic Studies. Hey, Spencer. Hey, Sarisia. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate you. I appreciate Darren. I appreciate the, the entire Peter Damon Group uh, here. Y'all do important work. Thank you so much. Now, should I call you Spencer? Spencer's great. It's good. Mr. Overton. No, Spencer, please call me Spencer. Okay. Here, okay. Right? Okay. Very well. Well, first with that, um, let's talk to you. Let's tell our audience just a little bit about yourself. Who is Spencer Overton and, uh, you know, what motivates and what has influenced your journey thus far? But just de definitely give us an overview of just who you are. Sure, I appreciate it. So my name is Spencer Overton. I'm the president of the Joint Center for Political and Economic Studies, which is America's Black Think Tank. Hopefully we'll have a great chance to talk about that. I'm also a tenured professor at George Washington Law School. I've been a, a tenured professor there since 2002. My specialty has been you know, voting rights, campaign finance, those types of issues. Uh, I also served in the Obama administration. I was the uh, principal uh, deputy assistant attorney general for the Office of Legal Policy, which is the think tank of the Department of Justice and worked on a variety of, of issues in terms of the Justice Department there uh, and, and worked on both Obama campaigns. The first one, I was a, a policy lead, a chair of a policy committee. And in both campaigns, I was uh, on the National Finance um, Committee. Uh, I'm from Detroit and, and really proud of, of my hometown. Uh, and I went to Hampton for undergrad and I went to Harvard Law School for law school and I clerked for an outstanding judge. His name is Damon J. Keith. He's hired more uh, black clerks than any other judge in the history of the nation. He was on the U.S. Court of Appeals. And unfortunately, a couple of years ago, we, we lost him, but mm -hmm. great influence on me. So that's the that's the snapshot of merit. I've got a couple kids, two boys. And just working at home to try to keep them in line. I know that's right. I know how that goes. Wow. So that's a great career snapshot. And I know that that was just a snapshot right. of uh, just some of the things that you've done. And I was definitely going to mention the fact that um, you're a Hampton grad because I, I love to highlight our power players who um, come from or uh, have been educated at our nation's HBCUs. I think it's still very critically important that we uh, lift up our HBCUs and talk about the extraordinary work and the leaders that they're producing. So thank yeah. you for mentioning that. And I'm sorry, I just need to lean into that because um, for me, I really did very poorly in high school. We moved from Detroit to a suburb and, you know, there were not a lot of black males and accelerated courses, other things. Mm -hmm. I just didn't do well. And Hampton took me in and just totally turned my life around. I mean, it just, I, I it just turned my life around. Things went well. I got great mentoring, and but for Hampton, I just don't know where I would be. So I just, I appreciate you lifting up HBCUs, and you know, more than just a rah rah. I just have to give a testimony because, like I said, the place made me who I am uh, and is just an outstanding institution. Today, in fact, is the first day of, uh, we've got a new president after mm -hmm. 44 years. Mm -hmm. uh, William Harvey did a lot of great things and that's mm -hmm. wonderful. We've got a new president at, at Hampton, uh, Daryl Williams, and we're looking forward to the, the future there. Uh, he's a, a general and a, and a Hampton alum and you know we're excited about the future. Thank you so much for, for that shout out to him. And again, I'm, we're going to move off of that, but just, mm -hmm. just so critically important that what you said is exactly what our HBCUs do. They take in our kids. They provide access to education to those who didn't even imagine that college was accessible to them. Um, and I'm sure that you were going to go to college uh, probably, but um, just the experience when you get there is such a, they wrap their arms around. Yeah, and, and being centered, it being about me and my development and this concept of being able to be very much a black male, 
but also, you know, an intellect and that yeah. not being an oxymoron, that being held up as a good thing and something valuable to the black community. I mean, it was just an incredibly important place. Learn leadership, how to work with yeah. other people. Uh, just can't can't say enough about it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's important because as we talk about the, our series is called the power play series. And I just want to, to, you know, underscore and emphasize that it's the place where power mm -hmm. players are made. So with that, you are the president of the joint center for political and economic studies. It's America's black think tank. So I do want you to talk about that. Tell us about um, the organization, its mission and how your leadership uh, is under, undergirding that mission, what mm -hmm. you guys are focusing on right now, mm -hmm. um, and how you're moving forward. Well, you remember the Joint Center was founded in 1970. So that was five years after the Voting Rights Act. There were all these new Black voters, all these new Black elected officials. And it was really founded to help these elected officials move from being activists to governing uh, mm -hmm. here in terms of how to operate on the inside. Uh, our probably most uh, famous past presidents, a guy named Eddie Williams, who was a MacArthur genius and, mm -hmm. you know, a newspaper man and set up a lot of uh, great things in terms of the Joint Center. I came in 2014 and we have really honed in on issues of the future. Uh, you know, I'll, I'm just going to quickly focus on on three issues as a snapshot, and then maybe we can get deeper in terms of questions, uh, you know, kind of appointments in terms of ensuring diversity and representation in the executive branch and the congressional uh, branches, uh, tech policy, which is incredibly important in terms of the future, and then also economic issues. Uh, I think all of those are really important future black folks. And like I said, we can we can talk in more detail. Let me let me stop because I'm 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 always interested in what's going on through your mind in your mind. Well, no, I think that it's important for our viewers to just have an understanding, those of us, those who live outside of the nation's capital, just to sort of understand the work that you're doing. Uh tell me, uh, so you've been there since you've been the president since since 2014. So we've had a lot of growth since that time. Uh, you know, the revenues have been going well. You were really focused on scaling. In just the last year, we brought in a, uh, three vice presidents uh, mm -hmm. here in different positions. Uh, communications, <clears throat> our VP there is a Pulitzer Prize winner. Uh, operations and development. The development is a former ED of a uh, executive director of a foundation. Right. Uh, so it is uh, exciting in terms of the growth and we're, we're hiring other folks as well. Good deal. Good deal. So you've been there eight years. Mm -hmm. so and, and, and let me just say this in terms of, you know, your viewers, uh, no folks kind of understand what lobbyists do and they understand what members do. You know, a lot of the discussion is shaped by think tanks in Washington, D.C. and in other parts of the country. So in other words, yeah, you've got members and their staff and it's great, but they're dealing with a lot of different issues. They're yeah. dealing with constituents, a lot of different issues. You've got, you know, academics, but sometimes academics are focused on theory and they're not necessarily focused on on policy. And so the thought is that the think tank, you know, you have some research and it's about policy that's moving now and what's happening and really trying to use research data and analysis to shape and drive the policy debate that's either happening now or will happen in the next Congress or in state legislature. So I really look at it as kind of the nexus between the academy and government coming together. But then also we hear a lot from advocacy groups. We hear a lot from the private sector. So we really like to be a convening space that's, that's focused uh, on, on some of the priorities of, of Black communities. And, you know, folks are great in terms of membership groups and mobilizing folks and great speeches. And that's wonderful. And where we fit into the ecosystem is really trying to provide kind of the data and the, you know, the rationale and the and the background to support uh, others in the community as they uh, do their their work. I love that. That's very helpful. You guys are kind of like the back end <laughs> to the 
to to the activists, the the politicians, the right. So yeah. what's under the talking points, right? It's great to have talking points, but what's under, what have we thought through? Where are black people are gonna be in five or 10 years in terms of the economy and how the economy is moving? Yeah. Um, the Trump tax cuts expire in 2025. How do we start thinking about that now as opposed to in a couple of years just before that happens? So thinking about like the long game, what's the research out there there are a lot of policy tables in dc where you know black folks really aren't at the policy table mm -hmm. and so trying to have experts who develop expertise and can really participate in those conversations and again not just be there using the talking points of somebody else but being right. you know real experts who have a perspective on on behalf of black communities that's so helpful um Thank you for that explanation um, and good luck for the next eight years, you know, your tenure, however long that you are you're right. the president. Yeah, and, and it's important to me. For me, the institution is important. Black institutions, I'm so glad you focused on HBCUs because institutions are key. You know, it's great to have an individual who can give a great speech or even who has good values and a good leader, but you know, leaders are term limited often or something happens to them. Uh, laws are rescinded or, you know, you know, invalidated by the Supreme Court or whatever. And, you know, we need institutions that transcend individuals, that transcend generations. Uh, the problems that, you know, we face were not created yesterday. They've been a long time in the making. Uh, they will, unfortunately, many of them will outlive us. And so we really need institutions that, you know, are a home to folks and are grappling with those issues for the future, but also, like I said, really serve as a home to develop talent and advance the interests of Black folks, uh, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now. Absolutely. Um Speaking of uh, things that will transcend time, I understand that you've written a book. I have. So the book is called <laughs> Stealing Democracy, The New Politics of Voter Suppression, I hear. So this is the book. You know, it's been around uh, a minute and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm proud of it. I'm, I'm, I'm happy about it. I'm excited about it. I think me moving to the Joint Center, I really had, after I left the Obama administration, there were two paths. One was, do I go back to GW and, you know, be a public intellectual and focus on voting, which is very important and I care about, or do I work on building a platform for other specialists and, and other, other things? So I'm here, at least at this moment in my life, focusing on building this institution for others on these important uh, issues. And we were talking a little bit about the issues before. Um, today, uh, we'll hear, I think, from the White House, they're going to release their, um, their White House staff information to mm -hmm. the public. They do that every year. They're required to by statute. Unfortunately, I don't know that they're going to release the racial a racial breakdown, which is something that we have requested. Uh, we just think it's important in terms of full transparency. As you know, African-Americans accounted for 22 percent of the voters, the people who voted for for President Biden. And so it's important that we, we ensure we're represented in the administration. So the Joint Center we're going to release likely later on in july we're going to look at that data that's released and determine the race of folks who are in top positions there are like three very top positions the assistant to pre the president mm -hmm. deputy assistant to the president and special assistant to the president there might be about 75 or 100 people in those roles uh here and so we're going to look at that breakdown and release that data uh, to the public. Another big thing we're working on is uh, congressional staff diversity. There's a big turnover in election years of yeah. staff on the Hill. And, and we have found that that is really the time to hone in on prioritizing diversity 
for members as they're doing hiring to fill some of those positions. Uh, I think we're kind of a leading group and kind of studying top spots like chiefs of staff, mm -hmm. legislative directors, that kind of thing. And so we'll do that. And these positions are important in part because they make a lot of decisions, but they're also important because they're pathways to other positions like being the chair of the FCC, the Federal mm -hmm. Communications Commission, right? Or to, you know, get into government relations and, you know, having a spot, an important spot is, is really important in terms of, of being a pathway. So we've had some successes, uh, Katanji Brown Jackson, uh, big success, Lisa Cook, who's the first black woman on the Fed. So we've had some successes, but, you know, we really do want to make sure that we're, we're holding folks accountable and we're keeping the doors open to ensure uh, a diverse administration and diverse government. Yes, keep the pressure on. That's something that Darren um, mentioned um, when he was talking so highly, speaking so highly of you. He talked about your work uh, in that effort, that regard. So thank you for, for doing that and lifting that up here. We want our, our, our audience to understand how important that is, and we'll be looking for that data and uh, we'll be uh, using it, right. uh, talking about it. And, and, and it's important because, you know, politicians may have a black district director or a black state director if you're in the mm -hmm. Senate. So, you know, that's what people are saying. But then sometimes they have no black folks in top spots in their Washington, D.C. office. Right. And, you know, the district is important, but, you know, it's kind of inauthentic to kind of have the black face toward the constituents. But then back in You're D.C. The <laughs> right, exactly. So so these are important positions. It's important that we, we release the data, but it's also important that folks at home are paying attention and saying, hey, this is important to me. Uh, and, uh, you know, all politics is local. And it's important that folks back home are saying, hey, where are you on this? Uh, you know, 30% uh, of your voters are black, but none of your top staff is black. What What's going on with that? Absolutely. That's why the data is important. So we can uh, do just what you said. So this is the think tank part. You give us the data so that we yep. can go and call our legislators and uh, we have some st substance and yep. data to back up our concerns and and. Uh, yeah, it's not, and it's not opinion, right? It's data. It's opinion, Here's it's the data, data. <laughs> right? <laughs> it's fact and data. So right. that's that's good stuff. Um, I want to switch gears just a little bit before we uh, wrap up. You're obviously super engaged in your work and focusing on making a difference in the world. So talk, talk to us a little bit of how you balance that. All power players have a balance. You have to balance that. And you mentioned the fact that you have two awesome children and a wife. So how do you balance all of that with home and yeah. just simply being Spencer? So, so Stephen Covey talks about this concept of sharpening the saw. And certainly my morning time, like uh, I have kind of a standard routine I do every day in terms of kind of prayer and um, stretching and weight work and, you know, a little bit of Bible reading and uh, some other uh, uh, standard routine every morning. And so that self-care is important. Uh, I was fortunate enough at Hampton to play golf and I, I continue to do so with my 80 year old father and my son's going to play with us this weekend, which is great. So I agree with you that balance is important. I know that we're about to wrap up, but I do want to, I want to lean into a couple of, of, of substantive issues. If that's okay. In yeah. terms of, so one thing I'm really concerned about, and we just filed comments to the FCC about this is we've got a lot of money that's been passed in the infrastructure bill for broadband. We did a study on broadband in the Black Rural South, and we found that 38% of Black folks in the Black Rural South, these are counties that are designated as USDA by the, by the USDA as rural and have at least 35% Black folks, right? Mm -hmm. This is basically the footprint of where plantations were, right? 38% of households in those areas that are Black don't have home internet. A lot of that is about not having access to the core. You know, a lot of people when they think rural, they think white, but there are a lot of Black folks who live in rural areas and need to be connected. My concern, frankly, is that 
the federal government is distributing this money to the states and the state leadership may not build out the way, you know, they may decide to focus on their political base mm -hmm. as a, in terms of the build out rather than black communities in the black rural South. So really kind of bringing attention to that, really encouraging folks in, in the South and particularly in the black rural South to kind of both be at the table, to make allies with like companies and other folks who can maybe put pressure on state governments to hold them accountable. We've seen this same play with the rejection of Medicaid expansion and as a result thereby, because so many of these Southern states have rejected it, and because so many black folks live there, you know, like 28% of people who are in the Medicaid coverage gap in our country, so they don't have coverage because they are in between Medicaid and traditional insurance, 28% uh, of those folks are black, even though we make up only 13% of the population, right? So we've seen these states reject the Medicaid expansion here. I'm, I'm concerned about them similar and we see what they do with gerrymandering and i'm concerned about a similar you know there's a once in a generation like uh, opportunity to connect kids and families black families and kids to the internet and education and workforce skills and health and if we miss this opportunity it may not come around again so making sure that's that's implemented fairly Right. So that's a big one from an economic standpoint, uh, from a tech standpoint. There are some other big issues in terms of, you know, earned income tax credits right now. Um, long and short of it is there are a lot of people who should get the tax credit who are working class folk and don't get it. And as a result, you know, government kind of taxes them a little bit more into poverty. WIOA, which is the workforce uh, uh, bill that's being updated. And it's important that that work for, for black folks. And we've also got an elevation of something called the MBDA, which is a minority business uh, development uh, uh, agency in the Department of Commerce. That's been elevated in the department. We've got a nominee, Don Cravens. We've got to get him through because black businesses are incredibly important to the future and to our economy. So I just want to hold up those those few issues as issues we're working on, but but we think others should be working on because we think they're really important to our future. Appreciate that. And they definitely are. Um, I appreciate the fact that you your focus on equity mm -hmm. and helping us to disrupt systems that to um perpetuate inequity <laughs> yeah, so yeah. yeah yeah well you remember the gi bill was supposed to create the black uh, the create the middle class but right. actually it increased disparities because black folks couldn't use the housing benefit because of redlining they couldn't use right. the tuition benefit because of educational s segregation so we don't want this big infrastructure bill to come out mm -hmm. and have a scenario where um, disparities actually increase because the way it's implemented is unfair in terms of not including Black communities. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Good deal, Mr. Spencer Overton. Thank you so much. Um, that's good stuff for our audience to know. Again, the more that we're armed with edu with information and data, the the we are we are equipped to, to speak substantively and with authority to our elected officials and those uh, others who are in charge of such matters on behalf of people, particularly people who uh, are often without a voice and are not at the table for themselves. So thank you. That's important. That's what being a power player is all about. And with that, I'm going to ask you, we ask all of our guests this question. It's a final question. If you were given one power play, you could the opportunity to solve a, a issue, a problem in this world, to make it better. It could be in your field. It could be anything. What would your one power play be? Mm, that's, that's deep here. Uh, I think it is, um, yeah, this is a dream, right? So we can just be broad. Mm -hmm. I just think it's like a Wakanda in terms of Black folks. I just think these challenges I, for me, it's not, oh, how can we eliminate racism or whatever? To me, it's how do we like empower black communities so that whatever comes at us 100 years from now or 150, 
we're strong, we're ready, we've got strong institutions, where we've created our own healthy scenario. And I'm not trying to take any thing, any responsibility off of anyone else. I'm just, my big thing is, as opposed to saying, oh, I wish the court wouldn't strike down the Voting Rights Act or, you know, kind of putting this in the hands of somebody else who's outside of our circle of influence. You know, how can we create a black Wakanda? You know, we've seen Singapore and South Korea leapfrog in a couple of generations and we got, you know, leading companies like Samsung and they're on the cutting edge. You know, how can we be deliberate? Like those women and hidden figures who said, okay, the computers are coming, let's learn, you know, Fortran and we'll be the ones who can, can drive this. You know, how do we do that in our community so that whatever bad decisions other folks make in 50 years, we're in good shape and we're helping to drive the nation and, and others in a good direction. And we're empowered to do that as opposed to being kind of at the mercy of the decision-making of other people who may lack good judgment. <laughs> Amen. So we can be proactive right, for our right. liberation yep. as opposed to reactive. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. To the shackles that others Im impose upon us. Yeah, so absolutely. That's good, Spencer. Thank you so much, Spencer Overton. Hey, Sarissa, I appreciate you and I appreciate, you know, just the rest of, of, of the team and, uh, you know, Darren and the Peter Damon group. And, you know, y'all just please continue to do the important work you're doing on behalf of, of clients, but also on behalf of the community. We appreciate you. Thank you. Tell us, how do we keep up with you or your work, the Joint Center? Or are you on the socials? You're on the web, the interwebs? How yeah. can we keep up with y'all? Yeah. I think the easiest way to have all of, get all of our info is to go to jointcenter.org. Okay. And there you'll get all of our social media as well as, you know, how to sign up for our newsletter and uh, all of our reports on topics like broadband in the Black Rural South, the future of, of work in the Black Rural South. And how do we get our reports? Right. We and get that, our, our data that you guys are releasing. That data is all at jointcenter.org. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. So you okay. hear it, folks. Go to jointcenter.org uh, and make sure you're informed so that you can be properly empowered uh, to continue the good work that Mr. Spencer Overton is helping to, to lead in advance. Thank you for stopping by the Power Play series. And uh, we'll catch you all on the next go round.